So what are the ramifications of a central bank digital dollar? And what level of control and privacy are you willing to give up for the sake of supposed convenience? In this video, I'll uncover new information on the central bank digital currencies or CBDCs and what it means for the future of your wealth and your freedom if you comply. I'll show you why this is the next level in digital authoritarianism and exactly what you can do to maintain control and do your own private banking outside of the system. Because it is absolutely time to CYA, cover your assets. Coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full service for those of you that like it so much, physical gold and silver company. And today we really do have to talk about the central bank digital dollars and digital currencies because, you know, most central banks are actually testing this. And why should you even care about it? How does it really impact you? Well, frankly, this is the transition into a new financial system. And these guys know how to do that. They've had a lot of practice. So I'm going to show you how they intend to do it and, you know, what, what is going on with it. But in this study from, let's see, this is the biz. Most of the data in here is coming from the Bank for International Settlements, which is the central banker, central bank, or the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, whose members are all treasury secretaries and central bank chiefs. So a bunch of central bankers got together and they laid out what this should look like. Okay, in fact, you've got about 80% of the world's central banks that are looking at or working on a CBDC, central bank digital currency, because if they don't, you've got the private currencies that are coming in, cryptocurrencies that are coming in. And, you know, central bankers are not likely to give up their digital, their uh, money monopoly so easily. But out of those, you've got 50% of them that are looking to do both a wholesale, which means it goes just to the banking system, and a, a general purpose, which means have you and I would have direct access to central bank currency, something we do not at this point have. And they are experimenting. And that's what you need to understand. This is frankly another of their big, huge experiments. And interestingly enough, you know, we are the guinea pigs. So here they're using proof of concept. So this is the stage that they're at. They're figuring out how they're going to do it. Proof of concept. And then you've got about 10% of the central bankers, primarily China's leading the pack, that actually have pilot programs out there. And frankly, all of the other central banks are going to watch the ones that have those pilot programs out there. But what they need to do, key design features. And remember, they don't want you to know that anything is going to be different, just like in 1971, just like in 1913. So like cash, they want to create it so that it seems to be like cash. And then, of course, you won't need cash, so it'll be really easy to take it away. But 24-7 availability. And interestingly enough, uh, this cash has anonymity. They put cash in here so that they can make their, um, they can, they can compare anonymity via V central banks. Well, cash is anonymous, but yeah, central bank digital currencies won't be peer to peer. So person to person or person to business or business to business, that's peer to peer. And they can all do that. 
interest bearing. So let's inspire you to participate. Maybe at first we'll pay you some interest so that, hey, let the good times roll. I'm getting interest on my money, which I never were was able to do with cash. Cash is a debt instrument that carries a zero interest. And then creating limits or caps on how much of it you can use. Now they can do that through laws, but generally speaking, at this point, there are no limits on the amount of cash that you can hold or have at this point. Having said that, you are also looking at um, the central bank digital currency with the ability, and I'll show you why, but with the ability to go ahead and put parameters around its use. You have to decide if, I mean, look, we may have absolutely zero choice about any of this uh, as far as using it, because if that is legal tender, and we're going to talk about that, then we're going to have to use that to barter for our day-to-day -day barter ability. But you really don't have to keep all your wealth in there. I, I'm not, I will tell you that. So here are some core features so that you, as they come out with this, you don't know that anything has changed when in reality, everything will have changed. It needs to be convertible. To maintain singleness of the currency, a CBDC should exchange at par with cash and private money. So on a one-to-one, -one, at first anyway, it should be convenient so that the payments should be as easy as using cash. You see what they're doing? You see how they're positioning it? So you think nothing has changed? Uh, tapping with a card or scanning a mobile phone to encourage adoption and accessibility. They want you to adopt this. It must be accepted and available. A CBDC should be usable in many of the same types of transactions as cash including point of sale and person to person. This will include some ability to make offline transactions, possibly for limited periods and up to predetermined thresholds. So they're actually saying that at first they may, they may create physical tokens to hand out as they get you away from the cash and used to the central bank digital currencies. And then finally, and they don't want you to know what it's costing you. So low cost CBDC payments should be at very low or no cost to end users who should also face minimal requirements for technological investment. So I, I got to tell you, people always prefer to pay the fees that they don't realize that they're paying. But I can guarantee you this those fees will be always be greater than the fees that you know about. And you really need to keep that in mind because I mean, I've personally experienced it. We all have, Oh, I don't want to pay that fee. So what's the cost? Oh, I don't want to take that money out of the IRA. I'm going to have to pay the taxes. I don't want to pay that fee. So you lose, you leave it in there and potentially as the currency resets, you lose everything. I don't know, what's the cost? You have to determine what the real cost is, okay? Here's a list of some of the current, the, the different countries that are either have um, a CBDC in pilot programs or they are working on them. It's not an exhaustive list, but there's quite a few. And just keep in mind, I've said this before, I will say this again, and I'm sure I will say this in the future as well, Central banks will not voluntarily give up their money monopoly. Ain't going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So again, CBDCs would help preserve monetary central banks sovereignty. Now we know that Facebook's Libra or Facebook came out with their own, what they call stable coin. Now a stable coin is a cryptocurrency that's composed of other currencies. So if you consider them stable, I guess the name suits. 
personally, a constantly declining in value currency to me is not particularly stable. And when they can revalue it, reset it, that's not really stable either. But okay. Facebook's Libra could gain a substantial share of payments markets and threaten the monetary sovereignty by accelerating currency substitution, de-dollarization, right? So that really forced the hand of a lot of central banks going, oh, wait a minute, you know, this is coming. And if we don't create our own currency, then you're going to have the private sector come in and take over. So migration into stable coins could reduce commercial bank deposits, which could sh shrink their sources of stable funding. This is, this is what they call sticky. In other words, when you make a deposit into the bank, then you're not likely to go in immediately and take it out. But what does the bank pay you? So it's very cheap funding. And remember, once you make that deposit, those deposits can be swept into a sub account in the bank's name and the bank can use that in any way they want to. You don't really, you don't really hold it. You don't really own it regardless, excuse me, regardless of your perception. Plus then these private corporations have all the visibility into the transaction data. If you expand that to include global stable coins, well, globally, then you have to have a whole set of rules that everybody follows and that's pretty challenging. So it's difficult to both supervise and regulate. But the key in all of this is the first line. CBDC would help preserve central banks' monetary sovereignty. They're not giving it up so easy. I don't care what your perception is. That's just the reality of it. So let's look at a few key pieces in here. Implementing a CBDC would enable central banks to more, much more quickly and easily implement monetary policy and charge nominal negative interest rates as a means of stimulating consumption. There, they say it, they admit it. They really have never not admitted it. They have actually, in all the papers, um, really, since they started talking about breaking below the lower zero, zero bound in 2015, they've been talking about pushing negative rates to a level that you would notice a decline in your principal and therefore you would be more likely to go out and spend that money rather than just allowing it to evaporate. Additionally, the creation of, I, I, I love this one, the creation of various types of non-fungible, in other words, not interchangeable. Right now, a key uh, component of money is that it's fungible. So this $10 bill is the same as this $10 bill. This gold coin is the same as this gold coin. That's fungible. So here, they're talking about uh, the creation of various types of non-fungible currency with particular constraints on or incentives for their expenditure. So when we're talking about universal basic income, if they issue it through the Fed now accounts and it's a digital dollar, well, they can create parameters. They can create, you must spend it within a certain period of time. You can only spend it on this or that, et cetera. So frankly, they can create the parameters and it's no longer fungible. One, it does not equal the other. And this is the one that frankly makes the hair stand on the back of my neck every time I think about it. It gives regulators and policymakers a panoramic view of what's happening in the economy or how you're spending your money. <clears throat> that enables better informed implementation of monetary policies. So right now, when the central bank creates a policy, 
and uh, some of this will continue, but when they create a policy and it, it takes 18 months to go through the banking system and go through the economy until they know, did it do what they wanted it to do? With a central bank digital currency and no cash and no other form of money out there, it makes it so much easier. They want you to spend money, they push a button, they charge negative rates. If you're not spending fast enough, they push that button again, those rates go lower and they can just sit there and keep pushing those buttons until you until it's going down so quickly that you rush out at to spend that money before your principal just evaporates completely. Well, that's what happens in hyperinflation, frankly. So, you know, they can call it this, they can call it that, they can call it whatever they want. They want the ability to create their own hyperinflation at their speed, in their control, to force you, although they call it nudging, you to comply with what they want. That panoramic view for regulators and policymakers. Woohoo! Whose best interest is that in? I mean, our forefathers have to be rolling over about what's happening in this in the world, not just not just in the country, but certainly. Well, how will they do that and make it executable and take it away from your ability to change? Well, with smart contracts for other novel capabilities. Oh my God. CBDCs could provide a way to translate a variety of financial innovations arising in cryptocurrencies. Now, see, they allow this innovation, they let the private market create it, and then they piggyback off of that. They create those public uh, partnerships, private and public partnerships, but these would be more closely aligned with existing regulatory and legal systems. And we know they have to change some things legally to be able to bring out CBDCs though I'm pretty sure, and I think you'll see it in a minute, that in this country, they actually don't need to change a law to have a digital currency, a digital dollar be classified as money. I believe it's anything that our Federal Reserve creates could be classified as money. But smart contracts provide a way to translate a variety of financial innovations. So in other words, they can put in that contract that is, boom, uh, you hit a trigger, it is automatically executable. I'm going to give you an example of that that um, was in one of the IMF papers on this that I read, and that was a car. So let's say you go out and you buy a car and you buy it with debt, right? So you have signed a contract on that car. Well, if you don't make your payments on time, in a, sm a smart contract and a smart car would have the ability to boom, lock you out of that car until you made the payment. And if you didn't make the payment within a certain time frame, with autonomous driving, that car could just drive itself back to the car dealership. That's their example, not mine, but I think you get the point. And I think it's a very, very important point to make because this is so in the system and this is under their full control. And, you know, maybe it's just because of my age where I'm used to more privacy for, you know, everybody out there that's closer to my age, we're used to a certain level of autonomy and we're used to a certain level of privacy. This gets rid of all of that. If that's all, if that's where all of your wealth is held, this gets rid of all of that, make no mistake about it. And it's gonna be by their rules. I thought government was supposed to support the individual. Oh yeah, that was originally. Yeah, no, forget about it, right? Things have changed so drastically. Now talking about that loss of privacy, and this is really significant as we have recently seen a hack into what, 10 of the of government agencies all right, so loss of privacy. 
It says, given the complexity and performance limitations of current privacy enhancing technologies, it seems likely that a true retail, meaning you and I would hold it retail, CBDC will expose new forms of sensitive information to its operators. Yeah, because they're going to hold your whole life on a blockchain that goes back to the beginning and just continues on. And yes, so CBDC designers should consider legal and technical mitigations from the outset because they know there are going to be problems with this. Is that okay with you? Do you trust that? Because if, if you don't do anything about it, then you're agreeing to it. You've got to understand that. So, yep, it is likely to expose new forms of sensitive information to its operators. Technological vulnerabilities or entrenched design mistakes. Hmm. CBDCs will represent a technical experiment whose risks of information security failures and fundamental design mistakes should not be underestimated. Shall I read that to you again? CBDCs will represent a technical experiment whose risks of information security failures and fundamental design mistakes should not be underestimated. If you do nothing to protect yourself, that you are going to be part of those mistakes. And you will have zero protection because they're going to make sure that legally they have CYA. You need to CYA too. I'm not kidding. I'm not, I can't make this stuff up. Really. CBDCs will represent an experiment. So just to do this one more time with the key points in each one of these areas, or at least what I thought were the key points, keep in mind, you will find the links to all of these documents from the IMF, from the, from the biz over on our blog. So don't forget to go there. CBDCs provide a panoramic view for regulators and policymakers. They will be able to go back historically. They will be able to go, they will be able to track it into the future. Oh my God, because then they can do everything in these smart contracts that provide a way to translate a variety of financial innovations arising. I mean, that means that they can do any darn thing you want. And who are you going to call? Hey, it's a contract. Again, if you're my age, you remember a time when it was mostly mom and pops. And if you were unhappy with something, they wanted to make it better. But is it that way now? Heck no. If you have a problem with a big corporation, you specifically, if you call them, you're getting somebody that has been trained to say, no, 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 block you. Well, if you don't know any different, I suppose you don't know any different. But for those of us that do know different, I don't like that. And by the way, I will say this, since I've been with ITM this year in June, it's going to be 19 years. We were just talking about it the other day. I have been really instrumental in the evolution. And look, I could never work with somebody with people that I do not respect. I mean, it just wouldn't really work. We're all like that, even though a lot of them are a lot younger than me. I think I'm the oldest one there now. That's okay. But we are keen on customer service because it's the right way to do business. But you think the government's going to do that? Have you tried to get a hold of a government agency? I mean, you know the answer to that one, don't you? And you got to ask yourself, well, with all of these experiments, what could go wrong? And do you trust it? Now, really, on the 24th, Fed Chair Powell said, we will engage the public on the digital dollar this year. So he's very keen on it. On the same day, in at the Federal Reserve, they came out with Fed notes 
preconditions for a general purpose central bank digital currency. When they say general purpose, that's primarily for you and me. Okay, legal tender status. The topic of legal tender status is often raised in the context of central bank digital currencies. In the United States, that status has specific meaning. Meaning, by statute, all currency issued by the Federal Reserve is a valid and legal offer of payment for settling debts to a creditor. Okay? So, if the Federal Reserve, or not if, when the Federal Reserve issues the digital dollar, that will automatically have legal tender status. Gold and silver is global money that does not require a government to make it legal as money. And that's been true for five, 6,000 years. But here was another piece in there, and I really had to bring this to your attention. Private sector entities are generally free to develop their own policies on whether to accept cash, specifically in there. So with central bank nudging, we all know, uh, I'm sure we've all seen it, that there are a number of retail businesses out there that have made the choice to no longer accept cash. Now, look, I've had this conversation with others and they'll say, but COVID, but cash is, have you heard of one person getting COVID from cash? One, one person. No, I haven't heard of one person getting COVID from cash. And yet cash was billed as, you know, a spreader of this disease. So businesses really trying to do the right thing have banned cash. But what they don't understand and what you need to understand, because it's in so much of the IMF and the central bank's documentation, is that they like a distance between their policy and how that gets implemented. They don't want you to know that it's their policy. And so they nudge the retailers in the direction that they want them to go. You need to understand, how shall I say this? Because on, on one hand, I can't say that I don't have proof because it's in all of the documentation. And particularly when you see them talking a lot about cash and you see this kind of stuff, they don't want cash because cash prevents them from going deeply negative interest rates, prevents them. So they'd rather just get rid of the cash. That makes it convenient. If the only choice you have is the digital currency, very convenient. Then they can do anything they want with you and you have no other options if that's all you're holding. I mean, I am so serious about this. Government bodies, they need governmental support is essential to facilitating the legal and societal changes that would be needed for the introduction of a CBDC. So whatever laws they have to change, and I know this one's gonna run long, sorry guys, but this is that important. Um, they need the government support, and let's see, are they gonna get that? I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in just a minute. Privacy, it will be essential to consider how privacy is respected and how personal data is protected in a CBDC arrangement. Legal requirements may vary depending on the role of a particular party in handling or uh, managing your money. But the central bank could have access to an unprecedented scale of granular transaction information. Possibly transactional data could be available, I love this, to certain third parties or in the extreme 
to everyone. Now, I really didn't have room or time to go into all of this as much as I would have liked to, but remember how they said that it should be low or basically no cost to you? Well, further in this document, they talked about the possibility of selling your data, which is what the tech companies do right now. You and I are the product, right? So selling our data to cover the costs of creating the CBDCs. This close linkage between money and data contrasts with physical banknotes, which do not carry with them transaction data that can be connected to a specific person and their history of financial dealings. Now, they would want you to say, but, well, why would I care? I mean, and you might be saying this to yourself. Well, you know, why would I care? I'm not going to do anything wrong or illegal. And they will certainly use the excuse that all of this will cut down on illegal transactions, except that if somebody's really going to do things illegal, they'll probably figure out another way to do it. But you know what even works better than currencies? This because it holds its purchasing power value. You can have a trillion dollars, but if you can't use it to convert into a glass of water, it does you absolutely no good. A trillion times zero is still zero. But we're in good shape because we have the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on board with backing a digital dollar. Woohoo! And of course we know what close ties she has to the Federal Reserve. I mean, you really need to think about this. But who's really showing us the way? Of course, I can't talk about this without talking about China because China is one of those 10% that actually has pilot programs out there on the digital yuan. China is pushing aggressively to be a global leader in financial technology. Yeah, over the last several years, use of mobile payment platforms has exploded in China while cash transactions have declined. At the same time, global interest in the development of central bank digital currencies has also risen. Now, the People's Bank of China is leading in these efforts. So, you know, the world if the world doesn't look a lot smaller and a lot more coordinated to you, then I don't know what to tell you. But China is experimenting like crazy, and this is coming to a theater near you. So it isn't just China. It isn't. And adding to financial data to digital authoritarianism. Yes, they are going to control every single aspect of their population's lives. They pretty much already do. This is the last nail. It will likely enable the Chinese Communist Party to strengthen its digital authoritarianism domestically and export its influence and standard setting abroad by eliminating some of the previous constraints on government data collection of private citizens' transactions, DCEP, which is their digital currency, represents a significant risk to the long-held standards of financial privacy. And part of what I love is this was a report out of a government agency. Go in and read the report. But they're sitting there pointing fingers while at the same time saying, well, this is how we would benefit, which is exactly what they're talking about here. We would have all of that granular information and with a push of a button, we could control everybody. You don't think they'll use it? Think again. I will just say this once more, the red part export its influence and standard setting abroad. Digital authoritarianism. Yep, coming to a theater near you. Because frankly, total control is the goal. We are chattel, that's all we are. But how do you, how do you catch a wild boar? 
You know, you do it with patience and you do it slowly and you get everybody used to it. How do you get them to use a new currency? Yeah, give it to them. This, by the way, so they they have distributed 50,000 packets. So that means 50,000 people in China got some digital yuan for free. Now, there were parameters around where they could use it, et cetera, and what they could use it on. But this marks the third test of the digital currency. Test, make your changes. Test, make your changes. Test, make your changes. It's a big exper experiment. And of course, I already talked to you about this back in the end of February that the PBOC, which is China Central Bank, joins cross-border digital currency project with other central banks. I mean, you know, so they are expanding their influence because really what we're witnessing here is financial power transitioning from the West, so from the U.S. to the East, to China. The problem is, is as far as debt is concerned, everything's got to reset anyway. I mean, it has to because nobody's in great shape and China fiscally is not in great shape either. The People's Bank of China involvement in this project hints at its long-term intentions to internationalize the yuan, which they have stated as a goal for a very long time. And so they're moving ahead, charging ahead with a national digital currency. The right, but this is also what you need to keep in mind. The right to issue and control digital currencies will become a new battlefield. So you see how China is really positioning themselves to take over financial power from the U.S. Uh, will become a new battlefield of competition between sovereign states. Yeah. If they have it all set up, and we're, we haven't even gotten out of the chute, I mean, we're still... We're still early in the game. Who do you think is going to win this game? Who has more control? And who are we going to learn from? Hmm. Hmm. If I cannot buy you a coffee without the government knowing about it, I do worry about what this could mean. But you know, there hasn't been, and I mean, we're all used to the lack of privacy. We used to have a whole lot more privacy than we do now. We're used to that. So the business, there's a business strategist in Shenzhen said she already assumed that most of her data could be tracked and had gotten used to it. And so she stated, I choose to sacrifice a little bit of privacy for convenience. It is always, 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 always sold as convenience. I mean, hey, there's two ounces of gold right here. This is kind of heavy. So if I have that rattling around in my pocket, it's kind of heavy. So wait, how about this piece of paper? Okay, well, this is a whole lot lighter and more convenient than this. So they transition us to paper. Well, who doesn't have their smartphone? Who doesn't have a phone handy? That is even more convenient than having to reach in your wallet, oh God forbid, and take out this. What are you willing to pay for, com com for convenience? Are you willing to volunteer your freedom? I'm not. I'm not willing to volunteer my freedom. Are you? Because that's really the question that we have to ask ourselves. And I'd like to point out that what is money anyway? It's a tool to value your labor. How much value do you think your labor really has? Because by design, the central bank system means that you, in reality, even though nominally it may look like you're getting more, in reality, you're getting less and less and less. So they devalue your labor. There's virtually no purchasing power value left in the currency. 
So now they got to attack your principal. Much easier to attack your principal if it's digital. Much easier. I choose to sacrifice. I don't choose to sacrifice. When I read that, I, I, I got to tell you, I was like, oh my God. Because that's the way so many people think. How do you catch a wild hog? Well, first you go out into the middle of a field and you put some food in the middle and then the hogs come and they eat it and you do that for about a week. And then after that first week, you still do the same thing, but you put up one side of a fence. So they stay away for a day or so, but if nothing happens, they get comfortable with that one side fence in there and they go and they eat the food. And after you get them comfortable with that, you put up the next side of the fence. And they stay away for a minute because that's something new. They're not used to it. But eventually, they come back and they eat the food and they get used to the other side. And then you do that with a third side of the fence. And once they're comfortable in all three sides and they're in there eating this, this food, you do the fourth side, you got them. You got them. Are you a wild hog? Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin because I know that a lot of people think that this is the savior, that this is out of the system. But what you really do need to understand, well, first of all, if you look at Wall Street and all of the products that they're creating, okay, not out of the system. If you're buying it from Square, you're buying it from someplace like that. You have to give them your social security number. They know who you are. Not out of the system. But China has led the way in this as well. Bitcoin rises after China region declares war on crypto mining. I always think it's interesting how Bitcoin is always portrayed as this when it's really that, right? It's an algorithm. You have to be a specific kind of engineer to understand it fully. I'm not an engineer. Sorry, guys, I'm not. And I also don't believe anything on blind faith. It's against my nature. Sorry, it's just the truth. But they want you to think that that's, this is an alternative for this. It's not. It's not. You want to speculate on it? Rock and roll hoochie coo. Just make sure that you're protected. Chinese officials first outlined proposals in 2018 to discourage crypto mining, the computing process that makes transactions with virtual currencies possible but consumes vast amounts of power. Now, to mine gold also takes power and energy. The difference is then you have some gold in physical form that's used across the entire swatch of the global economy. So it has full utility and a full base of buyers. When you create cryptocurrencies, you use up, you consume that energy. And it does not have use across, it's only used in one place. And right now that's mostly speculation. But going back to China, the local crackdown is reviving old fears. Beijing, since 2017, has abolished initial coin offerings and clamped down on virtual currency trading within its borders. Hmm. Hmm. If it was completely outside of the system, then how, how, how can they do that? I don't know. I'm not an engineer. Maybe some of you engineers can help explain that and write it in the comments. It's not out of the system. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm not saying I will never buy something like that, but I want to see where the dust settles first. I want to see who's going to survive because I think we're coming up to a point here where the battle lines between private cryptocurrencies and CBDCs are being drawn. And besides that, what is the UN and the governments and the central banks talking about the Green New Deal and how many jobs that will create? And those things, cryptocurrencies go against that. They just do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So we have some choices in here. You can have this, commodity money, 
which is in your control. I hold it. I own it. And guess what? Nobody knows that I hold it and own it. So I have complete privacy. You can have, oh, I didn't take a bill, a Federal Reserve note, which is debt-based. We know that, which is in their control. Inflation is in the design of the Federal Reserve note. A note is a debt instrument. But you still have a degree of privacy with it because, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Federal Reserve note. You still have a degree of privacy with it because I can make a transaction anonymously and nobody can trace it. Or we'll go on to the central bank digital currencies, which are programmable fiat money. What an innovation. The Bank for International Settlement says innovation, not revolution. I mean, I mean, you gotta ask yourself, how comfortable would you feel about having control programmable fiat money? Programmable. I mean, you're holding on to this and all of a sudden they decide to change the rules, which of course they can demonetize this. They can demonetize this. They could even demonetize this, but this still has value as a monetary metal, period. In any form, gold, silver, any form, doesn't matter what form it's in. And you have no privacy because it's at their discretion. Now, you guys have seen this many times. This is the Bank for International Settlements monetary the flower. This is their flower. And I'm going to show you because all this area, that's great. This is the central bank and their digital currencies. These are um, general purpose here. This little area here is for cash because cash is still too widely used to just go, oh, it, it would make it too obvious, the transition. So they're going to allow it to run alongside for a while. This area here is private digital tokens, general purpose. So that's the area that they would put Bitcoin and Ethereum and all those guys in right there. They gave it, they gave it a place, but it's not widely accessible, right? Cash is still widely accessible and is token based. In other words, it's physically based. Private digital tokens wholesale only is a much bigger area. And then of course, down here is your commodity money, gold and silver, commodity money. And I will point out to you that it is truly the only instrument that by a wide margin, larger than cash, larger than those, those uh, private cryptocurrencies that is widely accessible and token-based peer to peer. And tr truly outside the system because this is central bank issued right? There's your cash right there. This is a little more widely accessible because you can put that Bitcoin on a, on a um, thumb drive and take it anywhere in the world that you want. Now, it's so volatile, who knows? Maybe it'll be up, maybe it'll be down the day you buy it, the day you liquidate it, the day you carry it. I mean, who knows? But you do really have to ask yourself, which form of money do you think is going to protect your wealth and freedom the best? I mean, you, I'm not saying, now look, I have done it exclusively with gold and silver, as well as food, water, energy, security, community, and shelter. If you want to add some cryptocurrencies in there, rock and roll hoochie coo. Who am I to stop you? You got to do what you're comfortable with, regardless of what anybody says, including me, regardless of it. That's just my opinion. That's all I can ever give you is my opinion. I just try and have it be educated. I can't talk to those other things because I'm not an engineer, but guess what? This is simple, 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 clean, easy to understand. It's a real asset that is a monetary asset 
that is used across the entire swath of the global economy. There is always demand. It has the broadest base of buyer. Easy, easy peasy. It's no big deal. This physical gold, physical gold, physical silver is truly outside the system. It will protect your privacy. And where I used to, in my personal strategy, where I used to think once we made that full transition, the system was reset, that I would transition a lot of my holdings into the new currency. No, no flipping way am I going to do that. I will transition it as I need it because 100% of the time, I can always, always, for five, 6,000 years, convert physical gold and physical silver into any other currency. That is not true with fiat. And I know I've run long today, but this is that important because this is what they want to transition us into. Now on Tuesday, and it's already up because we did it live, I was on Rice TV X channel with Chris Rice and Lee from Pimpy's Investment Chat, and we had such a great time. I, I love doing those roundtables with those guys. They're, they're just fantastic. So if you haven't seen it yet, please, we've got the link um, below. Yep. Okay. And also uh, probably in the blog as well. Yep. yep. So go and take a look at it. We covered a lot of ground. I think you'll really enjoy it. And next week, I don't know when they're going to post this, but I'm going to be on Crush the Street. And, you know, I've been on that channel several times in the past too. And it's always a really good interview. But make sure if you like this, Give us a thumbs up, please. But I mean, this one would be one 100% share, 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 share. I know it's a long one, but you know, ignorance does not make you immune. It just leaves you vulnerable. And now is not the time to be vulnerable. If you haven't already subscribed, hit that bell. Subscribe. We'll let you know when we're going live. And until next we meet, please be safe out there. And oh, remember, it is time to cover your assets. And here at ITM Trading, we do that with the Wealth Shield, which is made up of physical gold and physical silver. Because that works way better than paper or promises. So until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.